Uh, hey, I think some good news that you have for us, right? As far as uh, news headlines, we have some arrests. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, 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 of course. Do tell. Um, so the police have actually made four arrests uh, thus far in the two murders that occurred um, this week. Two uh, in the first murder, which was retired prison officer, Mr. Harry Elliott. Uh, they've arrested a man and a woman in that incident. Mm -hmm. And during the police press conference yesterday, they actually said that as it relates to the woman, she has been arrested for aiding and abetting. And they wish to remind the public that it is an offense to aid and abet anyone. And then evidently this person, this young lady had been warned not to aid and abet and she still did it anyway. So um, she has now been arrested along with- How has she been, wait, how has she been warned? Like, I guess they told her don't aid and abet. <laughs> I mean, doesn't everyone know that? That's, you know, if you're, if you're really helping someone who does a crime. Well, yeah. You, you're, yeah. Knowing it and, and actually doing it, I guess it's two things. As they say. But a um, 33-year-old woman of Georgetown was arrested on suspicion of aiding and abetting an offender. And that, mm -hmm. that by the way, carries a sentence of up to 10 years. So yeah. I would suggest for, for anybody else out there listening, the law is not uh, playing around with you. No. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad there there have been arrests made. Absolutely. And yes. the other, and the other arrests, too. Are, so, and the you know? other, yeah, they've arrested two. Um, I kind of thought as I sat there listening to the press conference yesterday that this could be a very open and shut case because it's obvious that he knew um, his his murders. Um, yeah, he agreed to meet them, and so you know. Well, well um, credit where credit, so, credit is due uh, to the RCIPS. Absolutely, yes. Um, they and for doing the press conference, that's un, that's unusual. You know, yeah. I, I, think, yeah, I think a lot of people are just like, wait, what? Like this is happening mm -hmm. far too often. Yeah. Close to a lot of where you know, just a lot of business happens or a lot of people live. Yeah, it's not in areas you would expect it. Agree. Unfortunately. Yeah, yeah that one was, was um, yeah, quite, quite sad. And in other news, we had 11 Cubans that arrived on our shores uh, yesterday, this time in Grand Cayman. I know lately they've been coming into Cayman Brack and um, Border Control uh, it did issue a press statement saying that they were actually dehydrated this time and uh, not in the best condition. So um, they continue to take a, a risk, obviously, coming to the Cayman Islands and I guess getting anywhere they can outside of Cuba. But the Cayman Islands is looking to repatriate them as quickly as they come. So there are some mm -hmm. mitigation plans uh, now in place. So we'll see how that uh, works out. And another breaking news yesterday, headline news, this was a shocker. The premier of BVI has been arrested in Miami Mm -hmm. for drug smuggling and what? money laundering. Yeah, yes. Turks and Caicos, what? now this. This is so unbelievable. Wow. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. This is going to be like, a hot show like, topic like, today. Undercover agents. What? Yeah, like um, undercover agents trying to smuggle in. Yeah. So he was actually in Miami at the Sea Trade Global 2022 Cruise uh, Conference, yeah. which our minister premier was there, but thank yeah. you. He came back with <laughs> no Without surprises. Any <laughs> um, absolutely. <laughs> So this guy, Andrew Fahi, I think is how he pronounces his name, and his director of their port uh, authority or their port have both been arrested as well as the port director's son. Uh, the, there was a whole sting operation, a shipment of $700,000 in cash. And essentially they thought that they were meeting with um, representatives of the the uh, Mexican Sinaloa cartel, and they were agreeing to allow drugs to pass through BVI. Wow. It's crazy. It's just absolutely crazy. So, yeah, yeah. that was big news. It's wild. It's wild. wild. I mean, it's like some people watching, like, you know, old Pablo Escobar or something stuff. Mm. It's like, yeah, that was back in the day. People don't get away with what they used to back in the day. Exactly. I know stories, but yeah. So, can wild. you imagine the premiere of a country? It's just so unbelievable. No. No, yeah, but I mean, now it seems like the seems like a now he's going to go to jail. Yeah, wow. yeah, wow, federal, federal prison too. Yeah, it, does so he there go? You, the there states, you though? go, folks. Those are your news headlines for the day. But does he go to jail in the states though? For that, it's an yeah. offense in the states. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah they're not going to send him back to BVI to serve jail time. <laughs> yeah, wow, yeah, that Alrighty. was a shocker. Well, have a great uh, weekend. Thank you, guys. And you we'll too. Catch you on yeah. Monday. Right now, you can catch uh, Sandy okay. and CMR as uh, she kicks off her show on Bobo 89.1 FM. 
All right, folks, thank you so much. That's Blake and Aaron. So let's get our stuff started here. Um, so let's uh, play a little bit of background music while I grab all the links and send those out to the WhatsApp news group. If you've not joined the WhatsApp news group, folks, don't be left out in the cold. Get on it. We're happy to add you. So let us play our national song today. Beautiful song. folks welcome back 15 seconds left i'm trying to sort out i don't know what is going on with my uh i don't know why i'm looking so peppermint sorrel ginger beaver grass or english get it ready your morning tea just got hotter Ooh, honey child on the cold hard truth bobo 89.1 and cayman's number one talk show are bringing you morning talk like no one else monday rewind impact wednesdays caribbean connections and much more don't miss a beat with what's happening in the local community just keep sipping your tea what a mess. Here's your host, live and direct from the Cayman Islands, Sandy Hill. Good morning, good morning, Cayman. Rise and shine. Happy Friday. It is Friday, April the 29th. I feel like there's something that's going on in court today that I should be there for. Not for myself, but some other cases that we've been following. And so I'm just shooting off a quick um, email um, to see what I'm missing. And I need to look at the cause list. I feel like there's a couple things that we definitely need to be following up on that um, we haven't. So I will just get on top of those things. We got to keep you guys updated now. I know y'all want to know what's going on. 
Um, so yes, uh, we are here to give you all of the latest news. My goodness, there has been so much that has been going on um, over the last couple um, days, both locally and then regionally and internationally. I was trying to get caught up this morning, actually, on the news um, in Ukraine, because of course, I think the there was an American representative that went there to meet in Kiev, and um, while he was doing that, the Russians sent a huge insult by sending, uh, I think it was air-to-surface missiles, right in the capital. So you can't get much ruder than that. Not that rudeness is, we don't expect any different from Putin, but um, Putin. <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, um, he's sending some very obvious messages. Uh, narcissistic and all. So, so incredibly interesting. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, so let me just double check this. Double check a date here. So, you know, I try to keep organized with everything that I have going on. I'm going to have to, I'm looking for a little bit of a better system to keep myself organized with. By the way, can I just tell y'all that the camera seems to be a little bit off these days? I don't know why. Just seems like it's not, uh, it's too high or something. I need to shrink. I know I definitely haven't gotten any taller. But um, yeah, I've got to organize my, my calendars a bit better where I keep everything in one place. Because right now I do some manual notes and I keep some manual stuff going on. And then I've got my electronic um, system as well. But, you know, now that the CMR team continues to grow, we actually need um, sort of a collaborative calendar where we can, like, people can see when we have certain guests coming on, they can potentially book me guests and all these other things. So, hey, growing pains, but uh, we are getting there. It's all part of the process. You know, when you run a small business and uh, you're providing a service to people, you got to make sure that you yourself are keeping extremely organized and your team is also keeping organized. So good morning to Ervalyn. Marshall is here, Miss Rita, Buenos Dias. Uh, Wee Wee is here, Melita's got it locked this morning. Luis Brown, good morning to you. Wonderful musician, I saw Luis playing recently at, um, uh, oh gosh, what's the name of the restaurant again, Luis? Thatch and Barrel, they're in Pedro, big shout out to them. Uh, the music and the vibe is really, really good. Uh, Carmelie, happy Friday to you, so good to see you. Miss Beulah's got it locked. Felicia, John is here. Uh, Karen is also here. Catherine, Diamond Princess. By now, our radio listeners, I, I, someone messaged me the other day and they're, they're like, where are you reading all these messages from? And I said, well, we have put, for the past two plus years been live. <laughs> uh, we've just been on YouTube and um, Facebook. So we have a very loyal following every single morning. At least a couple hundred people tune in. If it's a hot topic, we'll have double that. Uh, who will tune in online to see what's going on. And people people like the visual. People like to be able to see. Um, some of you probably noticed that I did get my hair blow dried yesterday. So, um, you, you know, you get to actually see the visual and it's a little bit interactive in a different way. So those are where the comments are coming from. Uh, Facebook and um, YouTube listeners. And you can always go back and watch it. So if you miss half of the show, some people are like, oh man, I had to jump into a meeting at work or I had something else to do. The beauty of Facebook and YouTube is that those recordings remain online and you can certainly go back and listen to them at any time. So wonderful. So yeah, we've got our regular crew here. Miss Charlene is here. She says TGIF and stay safe. Lily Boo, good morning. Miss Sh Shirley is also here. She says, good morning, Bobo fam. Yes, love it that we're on radio now. Robert, good morning to you. Shelda's got it locked this morning. Janet is here. Charlene says, morning, Sandra. It looks like a color too. No, believe it or not, no, I haven't colored. I do need to though, because you see those grays in the front, Jill. They look a little bit crazy now. Um, but I haven't colored it yet. I think it's just because it's blow dried. You see like the old remnants of color in there, yeah? Um, so some of you will remember, I'm going through this bit of a transition with my hair, deciding to go natural. So I'm not processing my hair or anything anymore. And it's definitely getting a lot thicker and healthier as a result of that, but I still color it because, Hey, you got to give a girl a little bit of a, <laughs> a leeway here. Um, and I've got a five-year-old and walk around with gray hair with a five-year-old because like, are you the granny? I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> So, um, yes, I will continue to color. So I think I'm going to do a color appointment next week. But thank you, Charlene. Uh, Siobhan, happy Friday. 
Good morning to John. Uh, Omeria says, I'm locked, Sandy, TGIF. Hallelujah. Nizam, good morning to you. Richard is checking in from Rock, Ra Round Rock, Texas. That's a tongue tip twister. Um, thank you so much, Charlene. So we got a lot to talk about this morning. My goodness. Just when you think the world of news isn't going to get any more interesting, <laughs> you have a day like yesterday where it just pops off. So after the show, we got a message shortly after that the police were going to be having a press conference. I was like, oh, we got, we got an hour and a bit notice this time. So, hey, we were there. So I packed up my gear and I went. And uh, it was a, an interesting press conference for sure. If you missed it, by the way, it is on our Facebook and YouTube channel. So please feel free to go and have a look there at exactly what you missed. Uh, it was the police commissioner and two of his top brass. Um, my apologies for not remembering their names. One, well, he actually introduced them at the beginning of it, but one is a, a local guy. I think, is it Kurt Walton? I'm not sure. Forgive me. And then the other guy is, I think, from the UK, Peter something or another. So these are some of the top um, personnel there at the RCAPS. You know, obviously, they uh, were very, very concerned about the murder that happened the night before. They're working around the clock. And there were some very, very interesting things, I thought, that came out of that press conference. So I want you guys to listen to just a snippet, a portion of the press conference, and then we're gonna discuss it a little bit. And um, you can certainly tell me, you know, what what your thoughts are about what was disclosed. Um, super interesting. So here, let's have a listen to what the commissioner had to say about this particular offense. Thank you so much, Bonnie. She says, yes, it's Kurt Walton, a decent cop. Uh, Olivia, good morning to you. Miss Amdine has also got it locked. And of course, Miss Bonnie is joining us from East End this morning. So here we go. So it's uh, shortly after 1.30 a.m. this morning, which is Wednesday, the 28th of April. Police and emergency services were dispatched by the 911 Communications Center to a report of a shooting incident in an isolated location on the beach, approximately 150 meters down Old West Bay Road, west of the yacht club roundabout on arriving at the scene police located a 21 year old male lying unresponsive on the ground with obvious gunshot wounds to the head and at least two and possibly up to six shots fired from what we can see from our preliminary examinations emergency services attended the location and the man was transported to the cayman islands hospital where he was pronounced deceased we cordoned off the scene and immediately commenced a mortar investigation with a senior investigating officer appointed. Um, some gun casings were found at the scene, and we believe a number of shots were fired. Uh, a vehicle that has been connected to the deceased was located about a mile from the scene um, of the shooting and on the beach, and that was located at Swift Lane next to Cemetery Beach. That is a green blue dark colored Honda CRV uh, motor vehicle and that was found abandoned and recovered by police and is now uh, seized and will be subject to forensic examination and uh, similar to our last or our most recent shooting we're appealing to anyone in the community with information to come forward to assist us and I'll provide some more information in a minute that may assist but anyone that has any information is asked to contact the incident room 6492930 we give out the numbers through our media department and shortly there is an anonymous tips line uh, you can provide information directly to the rcips via our confidential tip line at 949-7777 or on our website and also crime stoppers is available online for any person who would feel more comfortable uh, providing information to uh, the police All right, folks. So that's the um, initial preliminary comments. We do have some more coming up in terms of what was revealed at the press conference yesterday. Um, so this young man apparently knew who he was meeting and he went to meet these individuals. I'm assuming that he did not have any fear for his life when he went to, um, to meet with them. Uh, I don't even know what to call this. This isn't a frenemy, somebody who you think is your I guess, I don't know if these guys believe that they have friends, but 
at least somebody that you kind of hang out with, um, you know, calls you to meeting and then essentially execution style, they shoot this young man at least twice in the head. Um, they believe upwards of 60 times, um, 60 times, six times, uh, he may have been shot. Um, quite, quite horrific and astonishing. Now, yesterday morning, we did um, say to you guys that it, uh, when I heard the name, I thought, the name sounds so familiar. And then, of course, I started looking it up. And indeed, um, this young man uh, was known to the authorities. And um, in fact, <clears throat> he um, was an, a key witness in several cases. So there was a home invasion back in, I think it was 2017, that he was involved in. And as a young man, he's only 21 years old, so he wouldn't would have been pretty young back in 2017. Uh, he was involved in this home evasion, an invasion and eventually he turned state witness. And so there's a lot of questions that obviously come out of this. It does look like some sort of a revenge killing, uh, which is to me astonishing that, uh, you know, people have been sending me pictures of who he was hanging out with. And they were like, why, why would he be hanging out with these people? He was supposed to be in witness protection um, of some sort. He had not too recently come out of jail himself, I think around December. <clears throat> And, you know, the question a lot of people are asking is why would he be hanging out with these people who obviously to everybody else would be presenting some sign of some sort of clear and present danger to him? And I don't know how to answer that. All I can say is, um, as the police have indicated, the criminal element in this country is relatively small. So I suspect that once you're in that world, it is very, very difficult to leave. And you probably don't have very many friends outside of that world. And so although these guys were involved or, or you know, connected to the people involved in the initial um, home invasion, and I mean, I wouldn't have been hanging out with them personally, but again, um, you know, maybe he felt like he didn't have anybody else to hang out with or anybody else to have his back. I'm not really entirely sure. But what we do know is that as a result of um, that, you know, he has now been killed and it really looks like it is connected to um, people being upset with him, uh, probably over him, you know, uh, providing witness testimony that has now placed several individuals in prison. So we will uh, keep you guys abreast of that. Um, the police have arrested two males. Um, quite interestingly, it was very, very swift yesterday. They were out and about, and they were actually out in the Savannah area. Uh, at one point, I saw one of the um, one of the the vehicles um, kind of go by. You know very, very quickly. This is before we knew that there was an operation going on. I think, hmm, they're in a bit of a hurry this afternoon. I wonder what's going on. And so the police mm -hmm. continue to ask the public um, to provide some, whatever information you think you may have that's useful to them. Um, there's anonymous ways for you to send your tips through to the RCIPS. Please check their website as your first point of contact. And um, Ms. Morna said that I heard he didn't want any protection. Well, this is the thing. Uh, let me just say this, because I think a lot of people are very, very critical of the RCIPS. The first question becomes, how is it possible that someone who is, um, you know, in a witness protection program actually end up dead? And I think Ms. Morna makes a good point. We don't know. The police have not actually said if he was in witness protection program, but I don't actually think that he was, because if he was, he wouldn't be just walking around in this um, in this country like he was, right? So no one can force you into witness protection. That's an option. And normally what I find happening with Caymanians is, Caymanians is when they place you in witness protection, because this island is so small, it means that you have to go abroad. And one of the more logical choices that they send you to is the UK, um, which is a big country. You can go to the UK and get lost and no one in Cayman necessarily ever knows where you are. But Caymanians are very small minded. I'll be the one to tell you that. Okay. Nobody else is going to tell you that Cayman is very small minded, small minded, but it's true. And there will be a lot of Caymanians who can never see themselves living off of this rock, no matter what, even if their life is on the line. Nope. They can't live anywhere else. They're not going anywhere else. They're not starting over. Part of it, I get it's a small town mentality. You grew up with these people, you know, that's all you know. 
So to start over in life with complete strangers, away from your family, away from your comfort zone, nobody would dare say that that's an easy thing. For a 20, 21-year-old, it's a lot easier than someone who's been here for 40 or 50 years, I must say. But I also get um, how mentally difficult and challenging it is to uproot your entire life um, for your own safety and to say, hey, I'm going to go to the UK around people I don't know, reestablish myself and the whole nine yards. Even when people go to the UK or the US, I've always been surprised by this, right? When I first moved back to Cayman, um, I would ask someone, oh, you're going to university, where are you going? They're like, oh, yeah, I'm in Miami. And I would look at them and go, do Caymanians only know Miami? Do Caymanians only know Florida? Like when I went to Tampa in the early 80s, there were like very few Caymanians there. I remember my aunt who didn't grow up in Cayman. So a lot of people didn't even know that she was Caymanian, but she was friends with some of the old schoolers like Miss Sheila, who had her restaurant, Jeff Webb's uh, mom, uh, her sister, um, Jan. So they would come back and forth to Cayman. And so my aunt had a bit of a relationship with them. And she was always curious about what was happening in the Cayman Islands, although she didn't really have quite a realistic perspective of Cayman, right? Um, and so, but, you know, a lot of people in Tampa, the, the days before there was a direct flight, even in Tampa, you'd mention the Cayman Islands and people would be like, where's that? Is that Jamaica? And I'd be like, what? <laughs> no, the Cayman Islands is not Jamaica. Is that um, the Bahamas? Uh, no. So the only place at the time in Florida that Floridians knew about the Caribbean, Jamaica, Cuba, and the Bahamas. I said, you do know there are a lot of other islands in the Caribbean, right? So, um, you know, but Caymanians stay very close to home. They go to Miami. And when I entered university then in like 96, 97, more Caymanians were starting to come. It was still a bit of an anomaly to Tampa. And some were going to like Hillsborough Community College. And there's a few that started to come to USF. So the Byron brothers, I remember when they started, I actually gave them a tour of their like first apartment in Tampa that they ended up renting because there, there was a company um, right there by the university that had like student housing. And so I used to work part time for them. Um, and I remember it was so weird to even see a Cayman in. One of the first Caymanians I saw in Tampa, I'll never forget this story, right? Just bear with me going down memory lane a little bit here. But um, Cassandra Powery. So one day I'm outside with my little dog. I just had gotten a puppy. His name was Oscar. And um, we had a neighbor. Now, you know, in the States, a lot of times you don't know who your neighbors are. It's a very different vibe. You don't get into people's business. You don't get into your neighbor's business. You don't even care who, who, who they are, really. But we had a neighbor next door, and um, there was these two gay guys living next door. And then there was another neighbor in the complex who didn't like gay people. So one day, he had assaulted one of the guys next door. And then he used the excuse when the police came or whatever. He used the excuse that my little puppy, Oscar, had gone underneath the car. And somehow, his uh, him assaulting this guy was related to him trying to rescue the puppy. It was a complete fabrication, complete lie. So when the police contacted me about this storyline, I was like, listen, first of all, don't get my puppy mixed up in no foolishness because little Oscar ain't got nothing to do with this. And so I was like, nope, that's not what happened. And he's just homophobic and y'all need to deal with that situation. And then another day I was outside walking Oscar and I saw this girl, really, really pretty girl. And she said, hi, now, you know, the States, a lot of times people don't speak to you. So I was like, oh, hi. And when she said, hi, I was like, hmm, you have an interesting accent. And she started talking to me. She's like, oh my God, I love your dog. And I was like, oh, I heard this came out in accent, right? Now, mind you, I had lived in the States for, at that point, probably probably 12 years. And I didn't really come back that often. But, you know, a Caymanian accent, once you grew up here, is embedded in your brain forever. And I didn't even have a Caymanian accent at the time. But I was like, are you from the Cayman Islands? And she said, yes. How do you know that? And I said, oh, my God. You guys have the most amazing, you guys, we now, you know have the most amazingly unique accent in the world. I would know that accent anywhere. And she's like, really? And I said, yeah, I'm from the Cayman Islands too. And of course, then it becomes, well, who's your family, who your mom is, who you're for, whatever. So Cassandra um, eventually went on to be a Miss Cayman, as you guys remember. But this was before then. This is when she was at USF. And it was just so weird meeting a Caymanian in Florida, at the, not in Florida, but in Tampa specifically at the time. You know, um, so yes, I get it. I get that people 
like to stay close to home. Even when they go abroad, they search out their own. So when Caymanians go to Miami, y'all got to click with the, you know, you got to find the other Caymanians, other Jamaicans, the other Caribbean people to keep your, your vibe alive. Uh, but when your life is on the line, folks, believe me, sometimes it's in your best interest just to take the opportunity to start over. Now, I know it's difficult because a lot of the individuals who find themselves in this predicament have no skills. It's not like he has a degree where he can be like, OK, I'm going to go and get a job in IT or, you know, I have a trade that there's something I can do in the UK. A lot of them are living on, I guess, some sort of subsidence. I think the government and the whole um, witness protection program is a little bit shrouded, shrouded and uh, it's a bit mysterious. Right. So we don't know a whole lot about it. I know of a few people who have entered the program, but a lot of people do not enter the program successfully because they don't do what they're supposed to do. So when people try to blame the police, I know even yesterday at the press conference, there were questions coming in and people were like, well, how can this happen? Um, oh, Cassandra Powell. Thank you, uh, Marshall. Powell. Yes, not Powery. She's a Powell. Breakers. Yes. Um, so yes, uh, you know, you can't be forced to go into witness protection. You can't be forced to follow the rules. Obviously they give you some guidelines and all this sort of thing. Um, I don't think they give you a whole new identity necessarily. I was speaking to a Jamaican lady yesterday and she said, well, in Jamaica, if you're going to stay in Jamaica, they're going to put you like, say your, your incident happened in Kingston, they're going to send you all the way to the other side of Jamaica to try and get you to hide. Now Jamaica has 3 million people. So it might be a lot easier for you to hide where you're at, right? But part of the problem is our desire to stay connected to the people we know, which is a natural desire, our family members and whatever, means that we're going to be calling them. We're going to be texting them. We're going to be, you know, and loose lips sink ships, folks. So a lot of people go abroad and they're supposed to be witness protection. They're talking about, oh, yeah, I'm in, I'm in Birmingham or wherever in the UK. And it's like, oh, really? But I know another key man in there and, and then they can't, they can't stay, you know, they get, they get antsy, they get homesickness or whatever. And uh, there've been a number of them who've returned to the Cayman Islands and the result, unfortunately for them has never ended particularly well. So um, it's a sad situation. Uh, you know, they, they never really, um, they never really said uh, you know, they, they never really um, said if he was or if he wasn't. There was a lot that the police, in fact, wouldn't say. And part of the reason why they wouldn't say it is because I think they're not trying to compromise their position. And they also were very, very cautious. And I need to find a lawyer who is willing to speak on this, but they were talking a lot about the whole chain of evidence and how they have to be extremely careful about the chain of evidence, because if they don't do a good job with that, it will compromise a successful prosecution. Now, someone said, and this is what they said in relation to releasing CCTV footage. So they said, you know what, they need eyewitnesses to come forward, especially when it comes to the identification of an eyewitness or someone's involvement, uh, not an eyewitness, of a, of a potential um, participant in a crime. Uh, and, you know, they need to be careful about how, how to prove that this is the person who was actually involved in this incident. Uh, I get it to a certain degree as someone who has studied evidence, as someone who sits in court cases all the time, and I hear how defense attorneys will pick apart that this isn't their def that this isn't the person who committed the offense. That's why right now, you know, they've not had a successful arrest and charges being brought against anyone in the mass shootings, uh, as particularly the second one, although there was a whole slew of people speculating about who it was. And the evidence was being circulated, the video evidence was being circulated in the community. And all of us amateur sleuths were like, oh, yeah, we know who that is. Look at this key thing. Look at this person's belt and shoes, whatever. The police can't take that to court. <laughs> so they can't use that in a court of law. But what I would really like an attorney to speak of from an expert perspective, right, is the fact that in other jurisdictions, including the UK, they do release um, CCTV footage. So how are they able to release CCTV footage 
uh, right after a crime and they don't compromise their um, evidence or their chain of, of identification. And there is a process by which in criminal courts, a person is properly identified. You know, there, there are things that have to be done. And even stolen property, there's a way that a person should um, properly identify stolen property, for example, right? So the world of evidence is really, really massive. Trust me, I still have my evidence law book here somewhere. There's a lot to it. Uh, and I do appreciate that the police have to be very, very careful in how they collect the evidence. But I still have some questions because there's still things that I don't understand. We pretty much follow the exact same criminal system as the UK, with probably a few exceptions that have been legislated here. But we follow all their, you know, our guidelines are based on like sentencing guidelines, oftentimes based on what happens in the UK, et cetera. So I'm a little bit confused and I need some clarity. So if you're a defense attorney, AKA Cayman's top defense attorney, Amelia, and you want to explain this to us, we would love to hear a very logical explanation for this. But let's hear some more from the RCIPS yesterday at the press conference. We do know that he left his home, uh, or left the home of a relative at around 11 p.m. last night to go to a prearranged meeting, most likely at this location off the old West Bay Road, which is an isolated area of beach. Uh, to meet two persons and the preliminary indications are that as soon as he arrived at the scene he was shot and fatally injured uh, with the persons leaving the scene and him obviously found uh, deceased at the scene with his car located about one mile away and I think the best location or landmark for that is directly opposite the fire station on the old West Bay Road for people that would kind of understand so what would be important is anyone that was out and about um, in the early hours of this morning or late last night that would have seen any cars or any person acting suspiciously in the vicinity of the old West Bay Road, any cars moving around, anyone that might have any information. And then the wider appeal to the community, as we have made only in the last number of days, there are guns in the community, there are persons in the community that have information. Um, this is becoming a kind of an intolerable situation with people being shot um, and, and murdered. Um, this is a young man, um, a married man with at least one, one young child. Um, we believe all the, the persons involved, the deceased and the suspects, are known to each other. In fact, well known to each other. And as I indicated, it was, uh, our indications are that it was a prearranged meeting that the deceased was traveling to and knew he was going to meet these two men. And then whatever happened at the scene, it, he was shot multiple times, at least twice in the head and possibly up to six. All right, so folks, at least shot twice in the head and possibly um, six times. So that was the uh, Commissioner of Police, Mr. Derek uh, Byrne, giving some additional information on um, essentially what information they had as of yesterday morning. Now we're talking about witness protection. I do have someone who sent in the message. Uh, they said, morning witness protection. They stopped sending people to the UK long, long time ago. Uh, they send you to the ghetto of Jamaica. That's why Caymanians come back. That's news to me. Um, I'm going to try to verify from the authorities if they're actually doing that. To me, sending someone to Jamaica for witness protection kind of makes zero sense because again, that is a little bit too close to home. So from the perspective that Caymanians um, are very, very connected to the island of Jamaica, you know, it's a lot of interconnectivity, marriages, family members, whatever, are Jamaicans, that doesn't seem like a really safe option. And uh, the comment that we're being sent to the ghettos of Jamaica, well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm guessing the Witness Protection Program doesn't have a multi-billion dollar budget, but um, the sending you to an environment, which again, is probably conducive to you continuing your way of life, um, I don't know if that would work. And so my question becomes, and we'll play a snippet here from what they said about the Witness Protection Program or Witness Protection, but how do they prepare someone? These are questions that I have, right? If you're going into witness protection, how do they prepare you, if at all, to enter into that program? Are they just like 
here you go. Here's a thousand dollars. You're in witness program. This is where we're going to send you. Are they giving you a new ID? I mean, I know there's a lot that they probably don't necessarily want to say, but I think people have a lot of questions about how the witness protection program works. And the other bit is for you to be successful in the witness protection program and to be able to stay put, wouldn't it make sense for them to give you some sort of like orientation that included your chances of actually being like, you know what I mean? Okay. You're going to go away. Um, these are some of the things that you should be doing. If you're going to the UK, for example, um, you know, you have no skills. Remember now all your life, you've been running around little West Bay boys trying to be a badass. Um, you know, in the UK, that isn't quite going to work. Uh, so you might want to get into trade schools. Like, do they help people do that sort of stuff? Like, I don't know. I don't know how hands-on the witness protection program is. Do they offer support and counseling for people even? Because I know this sounds really crazy, but again, you're going through a very tumultuous um, transition. It isn't easy moving to another man's country. I did it at the age of nine. And as a nine-year-old, it was overwhelming. It was life-changing. It was, you know, and as an adult, you might be able to understand certain things more, but I think that some sort of uh, mental health transition, some assistance with that would be useful. Is there like counseling for witness protection people? Like, I don't know. These are just some of the questions that pop into my head. So here's what uh, Mr. Peter, Detective Constable, I think is his official name, had to say about it. We can keep people safe. So I would encourage people to come forward, do the right thing, listen to our advice and our guidance, which we've learned over a number of years, and we can keep people safe and we can prosecute these people. So we will do that if people listen to us and do what we tell them. It's perhaps too early to say this, but is there any connection between this incident and what happened a couple days ago? So, yeah, good question. Thank you. So, so um, some of the same persons involved, or some of the same group, at least we believe involved, but not directly related to the incident uh, on Monday night. But again, it's this group of people that I mentioned earlier in the week that we believe we have identified and that we are actively seeking. And I mentioned our additional patrols for our firearms response unit that are out on our crime task force actively seeking these persons. One person was arrested last night by us and is currently in custody and that investigation is ongoing and will take take its course. So one of the persons of, of the gang has at least has been arrested and we actively seek um, other members of the of the group. All right, folks. So somebody else said that that's when you're a career criminal, that's where they send you to hang out with more career criminals in Jamaica, apparently. Uh, they say the ladies usually go to the UK. So um, super interesting. Um, hmm. uh, this, I mean, okay. Uh, I knew someone just a couple of years ago, a young man who was starting to get into some issues that they actually sent um, to the UK still. So I don't know. I mean, I don't really know. Someone else says it's true that they send you to the slums. They don't check to see if their witnesses have food, medical care, or even if no more than just a regular check to know if they're alive or dead. Wow. Uh, this is quite interesting as it relates to the witness protection program. I think we need to find out if some of these things are true because there have been some criticisms that I've heard over the years about the witness protection program. So now this makes me kind of wonder even more. So Carol says, you don't agree to meet someone at that time of the night at a secluded location and expect to chat or play dominoes and have a beer. Well, certainly we wouldn't probably be doing that, Carol, but um, when your friends are of a different caliber, maybe that's what you do. Maybe you hang out at the beach. Maybe this isn't the first time that his friends called and said, oh, let's, let's hang out at the beach. And they were going to just have a few drinks and shoot the breeze and decide what the rest of the week was going to be looking like. I mean, I just don't know. So someone actually drove him to the scene is what the authorities believe. And then the car was parked um, eventually down by Cemetery Beach, which is closer to the West Bay Fire Station. So this is some information that came out of the um, that came out of the press uh, conference yesterday. Now, it's it's interesting because um, in my mind, it is um, very I, as I'm sitting there listening to all of this, I'm like, hmm, 
this seems like a pretty easy one for the RCIPS because if you were agreeing to meet people, you start with those persons as your first uh, line of inquiry, right? So there has to be text messages, there has to be phone calls. And so I'm sure that they were pulling those records um, immediately to see who they were in contact with. Now, some of these guys think that they're smart with um, technology and they try to get like burner phones that aren't necessarily in their name. And let me just say this much, a lot of cases in this jurisdiction have been won because of advances in, um, you know, technology. So if you're planning a crime and you're using WhatsApp and you're trying to talk in code and all this sort of thing, it doesn't normally work in your favor as a criminal. I'm just telling you, again, I sit in court, even the Tortuga robbery, um, you know, they were trying to explain these messages and the cell towers are pinging your location and they're showing you traveling from prospect to town um, and then onto Seven Mile Beach and you claim that you were home that night, if that ain't going to work, then why was your phone making these movements? And why was your phone placing you in the same location as someone who's being accused, your co-accused of the same offense? And yet you claim that you don't know this person. You know, uh, you're sending messages through your phone and they think, oh, well, I have five aliases and they don't realize that the police know <laughs> your aliases and they can check your, not just your WhatsApp messages. They can check your Instagram messages, your Facebook messages. And they're like, okay, you claim that you don't know this woman, but yet we have a history of messages between the two of you um, through Facebook Messenger. Why would you be talking to someone that you don't know? That's what a defendant doesn't even take the stand, Chuck, because he's like, oh, shit. <laughs> I think I might have just been caught right-handed. Um, so uh, cellular data and technology for a long time has been assisting the police in solving a lot of crimes, thankfully so, right? I'll even remember, as you guys might recall, when poor Estella Roberts went missing, one of the first things, because she worked for Cable Wireless at the time, one of the first things they started to do was to put a trace on her phones to see, you know, what movements uh, were occurring in the phone. And it is my understanding that that was really pivotal in them being able to track down her killers because they stole laptops and cell phones and stuff from her. And at one point they could pinpoint her cell phone in the Barker's area of West Bay. And then the cell phone went dead. So they turned it off. And then they turned it back on and they could see it like in Georgetown. So that's how they knew. Remember they left, the evidence showed that they left West Bay on a bus um, and they came into town or whatever. They drove, you know, they came into town. And um, then there was movements of them actually getting on a plane. Like one of them went back to Jamaica because things were a little bit hot. He jumped in the flight. I mean, at the time the streets were saying, and I haven't certainly verified this, but the, the streets were saying that when he was on the plane, there were actually detectives there on the plane with him watching his movements because they were already kind of honed in and who they thought might have done this. Uh, because of the cell phone data that they were getting. And again, because she worked for Cable Wireless, Cable Wireless wasn't even, they probably didn't even wait to get a, a request from the police. They were on it like white and rice, right? And so it was a lot easier to sort of um, apprehend her assailants based on that. And it happens all over the world. You know, people go missing. Okay, the last known point for, for them was here because of their cell phone or whatever. So those cell phones are tracking you. And sometimes it's a good thing that they're actually tracking you. Good morning, Daisy. Good morning, El Campa. Uh, Janetta says, shout out to my son, Andre. His birthday is officially on Sunday. We were excited uh, for him as of today. We love you. God bless. So happy birthday, Andre. Uh, Aliano says, I'm sorry, Miss Sandra. If you walk like a duck, it's not a chicken. Yes, racial profiling is a rough concept to execute, but if you walk the lifestyle of thug, prepare for rough life. I just turned 38 and it's not easy, but it's not hard also to make life changes. Just need to have a good talk to my Hennessy alter ego. So what would your Hennessy alter ego be telling us? <laughs> I'm curious. Good morning, strong will. Um, thank you so much. Um, appreciate the uh, compliments. Um, I saw somebody saying, oh yes, Aliano also says, uh, turn up the heat. You need to have a segment called Fiery Friday. Mm. Oh, mess. Uh, Amjad says, do we have police in Cayman? First time I hear. Yes, Amjad. And to be fair to the police, I know that uh, 
we do criticize them a lot. But to be fair to them, even yesterday when someone sent in a question saying that, um, you know, they don't really solve a lot of crimes, the police said, actually, we would disagree with that. Look at our track record, you know, especially for serious crimes. We have a lot of offenders in jail and some have been sent overseas who um, are there because of good policing. And listen, I'm going to give the police their due, their credit, right? I'm not here to lambast them and say that they do nothing right and they get nothing right and whatever. Sometimes they mess up. And of course, when somebody messes up, we always hyper-focus on those mistakes. But in fact, they have been very successful in getting a lot of hardcore criminals off the streets. Now, don't you think it's interesting that we put the entire burden of policing on the police? Think about this for a second. A lot of y'all are living with these criminals. You know what they're up to. You know what you're doing, what they're doing. And you sit back and you provide no assistance to the authorities, no assistance to the police. And yet when they're out there murdering people and doing the most, you think, oh, that's just the police's job. The community has a role to play as well. You know what I'm saying? We should be helping the police wherever possible. And those of you who continue to harbor these criminals, you have got to stop it. Now, I want to talk about um, the harboring of criminals because um, this is really, really important. And the police have indicated that they have arrested someone, right, because she was aiding and abetting a criminal. And the police are saying, we're not going to be playing with you all anymore. And it is a criminal offense. Now, here's what the police had to say on the award system because we should all be coming forward for the right reasons and not just because there's a financial award. But a lot of us think, well, a financial award is helpful. Sometimes it's not as helpful as you think because people are still afraid and money can't <laughs> remove that fear for them. So here's what the RCIPS said when we asked the question, was there a financial reward being uh, made available? Access to Crime Stoppers and we have at least one person, member of the community that came forward yesterday offering significant money to assist us. But at the moment, we're looking at our internal resources and our communications with the with the community, our liaison that we've established. And then we will certainly look at that option. If it becomes something that would assist us, uh, we would be very um, open to using a reward system to seek assistance. We have in the past tried to use rewards and it hasn't been successful, but it does remain a very viable option and as I said, one prominent member of the community at least has come forward and we do have access to Crime Stopper phones to assist us. All right, folks. Um, so essentially they were not offering an award yet, but they said, you know, they have access to Crime Stoppers and um, if possible, um, you know, they could activate that. But they, they have found that in a lot of instances, um, the offering of a, an award, a reward doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to come forward. 936-2626 folks is the phone number. Do join the conversation if you'd like. Lots of comments coming in. Um, so Everton says, good morning, Sandy. Sometimes the phone could be a good evidence. Find who the last person that they talked to and may have his phone number. Then you can trace it back. So yeah, no, I think cell phone evidence is, um, and the thing about cell phone evidence, it's pretty hard to dispute cell phone evidence. Like it's pretty much, you know, a good clincher in terms of the world of evidence, right? Uh, you don't have too many people who can go in there and be like, well, the cell phone towers weren't calibrated properly. So we don't know. No, 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 no. Uh, you know, they, they cell phone technology is amazing. And uh, the reports that these um, companies can pull off and they have forensic uh, people who train in that sort of thing that can look at all that. Yeah, it's, it's not easy to argue with cell phone evidence. And um, people take their cell phones everywhere. So they really act as your personal GPS. So Marshall says witness protection in Jamaica, like really? No one is safe in Jamaica, not even Jamaicans themselves. Hmm? Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't think Jamaica would be a first country of choice. Um, but I have to wonder if part of the reason for that 
is maybe these individuals can't even get into the UK. I was just thinking about that from an immigration perspective. Sometimes there are certain jurisdictions that are off limits uh, because of different things. Like, I don't really know. Can they not get a passport maybe to travel to the UK, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, like I said, I do know of a case just a couple of years ago where the um, the mother was going about trying to secure the child's passport and do all this stuff. Didn't seem like the police would do those things for you. They leave certain elements up to you to do. And once you get those things in place and you're able to travel, then they facilitate, I guess, the airplane ticket and whatever overseas. But listen, these guys are on social media. They're posting up exactly where they are, even in the UK, um, trying to floss and trying to, you know, even if they're not here in Cayman, trying to keep in contact, even if it's just virtually uh, with their Cayman connections. So I do think that a lot of this will rest squarely on the shoulders of the individuals who are seeking to get into witness protection. And if you don't do a good enough job of keeping your identity private and letting, you know, Instagram and Facebook post up your location, And I've seen people go and change their location to say, oh, I'm in London. I'm in this neighborhood. I'm in that neighborhood. I'm like, damn, y'all not the smartest (laughs) when you're supposed to be in witness protection. So who knows? Um, Everton says in the U.S., the police always try to find out the phone number of the person or if they had if they can get the phone, they trace the phone back to the cell phone tower. Good forensics and not only good forensics, but we've seen in other cases again. People do have burner phones. And even here, there's been a couple of criminals. They think they're smart. They'll have a primary number and they'll have one or two burner phones, which they only use for the commission of criminal activity. So when they get arrested and you have uh, their regular phone on them, you're not going to see any evidence of these conversations, right? So they have these burner phones. The sole purpose of those phones is to carry out their communications as it relates to um, criminal activity. And then they hide those phones somewhere else, but the police has found them in the past. So we do have a caller joining the program. Good morning, caller. Good morning, Miss Sandy. How are you? I'm good. Happy Friday. I know what you're going to say. You're blessed and highly favored. Hey, Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good all the time. Yes, ma'am. How are you? I just said God is good, okay. blessed and highly favored. All right, all right. Let me let me My give you is- hold on. Let me give you a little praise button. Hold on. Praise the Lord. There you go. Yes, ma'am. Sandy, what's on your mind? I just want to participate in your show this morning. Why not? Regarding the issue, um, with I heard you mention that. You uh, they ask for if a reward is being given. Uh-huh. No, you know, I know, uh-huh. Cayman know. There's no trust between the police and and our people. Uh-huh. There's no trust. That trust have been broken. Uh-huh. Um, people are not going to come forward because. The names tend to leak out. They got this information from this one. They got this information from that one. And I am telling you from personal experience Mm -hmm. with the police. Mm -hmm. I reported something. My name was mentioned. It was Miss Welcome who made this call. Right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. are the police expect to get? What are they expecting to get from our people? Mm -hmm. What kind of information when they know it would put them in jeopardy? Mm -hmm. We came and got sense. We're not stupid. So, of course, we're going to stay quiet. Or some of them, a majority of them going to stay quiet. Of course. You understand. The police needs to build that bridge and fix that. They need to wean out. Um, those corrupt officers and maybe people would be willing to trust them once again and come forward and give them information. Uh But then it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Also, what I really would like to say is that I am so hoping someone would read my my comments that I put up on that um, live yesterday because Right now, the way that I am looking at it and other people, I'm pretty sure, are looking at it, the commissioner should be blamed or charged for these these um, offenses that have been happening. 
And here's why. He knew that these activities was going on. He knew exactly where and where they're, go they were um, they're, they're happening. We took him firsthand, Sandy, uh -huh. and point out these places to him. Uh -huh. You understand? And nothing was done. And it wasn't yesterday. It was, must, uh, I think, about over a year and more. Uh -huh. We took the commissioner personally on a tour through our communities and show him firsthand and nothing was done. Now he has the audacity to go on live and say this and say that and expect people to believe him. As I told the governor, I am sorry, you're looking for answers. You're looking for people to appeal, to, 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 to come in and give him mm -hmm. them answers. Look to your commissioner because it could have been prevented. Her police refuses to be proactive. I believe in being proactive. And it's not only her police, you know, it's mm -hmm. DCI and it's planning as well. Refuses to be proactive mm -hmm. because we have been reaching out to planning and we have been reaching out to DCI. And up to this day, you can't hardly get anything from DCI. Planning is assisting in some way or sort. But then they comes with this thing, oh, if it's five years, there's nothing planning can do about this structure that housed this illegal activity. Mm -hmm. You want which create these chaos in our communities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You understand? So even if I've, I've found that even if it was reported and the five years passed, planning still doesn't do anything about it. Which is wrong, mm -hmm. I, which is dead wrong. And I think planning and DCI and our RCIPS force needs to step up to the plate and do what they're being paid for. They need to take matters into hand because our island has gotten away. And if things don't change, if things don't look after more seriously, it's going to get worse. Hmm. It's going to get worse. You understand? Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the commissioner, what our governor is expecting. But if you're not listening, you go. My, my grandmother used to say, ears can't hear backside with show feel. Mm -hmm. So this is right now is where the backside feeling. You understand? And mm -hmm. then putting so many resources out to do what? To learn what? To hear what? When he knows the nitty gritty of it? Cut the bud from the, but he was saying nip the bud, nip, nip, nip it from the bud. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Petty crime is what we got from the police. When you're reporting or you report, oh, there's this one is selling numbers or that one is selling numbers. And, and it, 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 oh, that's petty crime because they arrest them. They go to court and they, they get a slap on the wrist. They come right back out and they start to um do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I personally think if once they have, arrested someone in an establishment, a licensed establishment and uh, for numbers or any illegal activity, just that license for that premises. DCI have the powers to take away that license mm -hmm. because of what is happening there is not what they apply for. Mm -hmm. That would teach our people some sense on what, uh, whether they cherish their license or not. Okay. You understand? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so they need to start somewhere. They need to start somewhere. You understand? And I just think that then here is here and now is where they need to put their foot down and say enough is enough and get the ball rolling. Let's work together and get Cayman back to where it was. You understand? Immigration. There's that's another situation. Mm -hmm. When last have you seen immigration on inner streets? Checking people when last I couldn't tell her last year. Mm -hmm. You understand mm -hmm. to see whether they're here, um, legal or illegal. We have so many people have taken out permits, permits for people, Sandy, and they are just sitting in our communities selling numbers, not working, or that's all the work they're doing is selling numbers. You understand, mm -hmm. which is wrong. 
Immigration as well needs to step up to the plate and get back active in our communities. Yeah, just like how the police needs to get back on foot. And I repeat, on foot in our communities. Mm -hmm. Now, it what makes about, a difference. What about when the police say, Miss uh, Romelia, what about when <clears throat> the police say, listen, we understand the community's concerns as it relates to what we need to be doing, but the community also has an obligation. So when parents are housing um, criminals in their own homes, when they know these boys are out there selling drugs, committing robberies, potentially even killing people and doing all this other stuff, and they do nothing about it, do the people, family members, community members not also have an obligation when it comes to crime fighting in this country? Yes, yes, they do. But then it boils back down to Sandy that even if I have, for example, I have someone, not my CC, but let's say if I have yeah. someone who, who committed a crime and I go secretly and tell you, no, that was my daughter who did that or that was my son who did that. When you hear from the show, they come back and, oh, I know it was you. I know it was you. I was told it was you. What do you yeah. expect? And huh? do, do you think that that is happening because um, Caymanians are part of the police force? So one of the interesting arguments over the years that has been made is this is exactly why uh, they bring in foreigners into the police force, because a lot of Caymanians mm. have this loose lip syndrome where everything we Lose. hear, we talk. Mm. Well, what, what, what do they say no, about everything? What, what's that saying about what's good to whatever isn't good to chat? Everything you eat, not good to chat mm -hmm. or something like that. So is it is it really the Caymanian officers and the Caribbean officers who are more likely to engage in the chatter and engage in the sharing of information, um, whether it's inadvertently or on purpose, versus a lot of the English officers? I got to tell you, they're not into the chit chat and the back and forth. Do, do Just, you think that um, Sandy, there? honestly, honestly, I have not had or I'm not aware of an of the of an issue with a Caymanian, mm -hmm. but I'm aware of the issues with the Jamaicans. Um oh, it, Car Caribbean it actually, people it they love to chat. I, it, was a, it was a Jamaican first uh, officer who did who who did it to me. Mm -hmm. It was a Jamaican officer. You understand? And you see, and the, what's 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 um a lot the next thing I want to say regarding the Jamaican officers mm -hmm. is that a lot of the issues that are happening, especially in our communities, are Jamaicans. When a Jamaican officer comes to assist, you know, nothing going to take place, right? You see them bouncing up and laughing up and chitting up and chatting up with these, with the, with the, 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 the culprits. And at the end of the day, nothing gets done. I've had an officer said that Oh, I am not ruffling no Jamaican feathers here in Cayman because they might send back home and kill my family. Or they um or or when I go back, retire and go back home mm -hmm. and me them back up, that would be a problem for me. Why come Cayman and get a job as a police officer if so be the case? You understand? Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of people in our communities, when they call the police for assistance, they tell them straight up. Do not send me no Jamaican officer, huh. which is, I mean, it's sad, but it's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. It is sad, but it's true. You understand. But as I say, I've never had the issue with a Caymanian or known of a Caymanian blabbering. And that's why I, I say, well, why isn't there a lot of or, or, or more Caymanians in the police force? But we have had some quality police officers mm -hmm. quality police officers in our force and it not for the matter of retiring that they say oh they're tired of working why they left the force because then when you look they end up in other law enforcement agencies something is wrong in that um, police force and it needs fixing that's why our Caymanians are not staying when last or uh, I do not know of a, Cayma a Caymanian and all of this um, promotion that went on uh, um, last month or month before last, I don't know of any Caymanian getting any form of moving up. Our mm -hmm. Caymanians need to be in our force. And I think that what needs to be done is that they should, that, uh, they, um, they should have a career, a career um, 
program in school for, to, to teach our children would be able to learn from in school whether they want to be a police officer. If they decide they want to be a police officer, they start that course from in high school. Mm -hmm. They want to be a custom officer, they start that in high school. They want to be any sort of civil service, they should be able to start that in high school and come out and take our jobs back because foreigners are overtake over um, taking our, our, our jobs that our kids don't have any are not being employed. So I think that career move should happen in our high schools that when our kids that graduate and come out of school, they can, should be able to go and get, pick up a job in civil service, in the civil service and, and, and without any problems or without, oh, they're not educated or you don't have the qualification because then that is really getting to me right now with that, those answers. You understand. And as I told our DG but a couple do you, weeks back let, on Let me show. just ask you a question, though. But do you think that, um, because I do see, in all fairness, a lot of Caymanians who are struggling. And um, mm -hmm. not to say that it doesn't happen at, at all levels, because we were just talking about the situation with Flo the other day. You know, Here's an example of Danny Tatum, who's been there for 30 years and still isn't getting the top brass job. And we don't understand why. But there are a lot of instances where there's a segment of truth in the criticisms that people are levying. So in this day and age, you can't barely come out of high school, have no high school diploma at all and expect that a job is just going to fall in your lap. Like that doesn't happen anymore. No. Nope. So what, mm -hmm. what can our people do to try to pull themselves up? You know, we need to pull up our own britches and really get to the yeah. bottom of this and encouraging our young people to make sure that they're prioritizing their education, their skills, training and whatever, you know? You know, Sandy, a couple years back, I approached the um, ex-premier uh -huh. and spoke to him regarding our school system. Uh -huh. If cer a certain part of the world you go, you find kids have to take their education seriously. If they do not meet certain levels, they repeat them. Uh -huh. And I feel that repeat would be Two things, a benefit of to start over and to and 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 the next thing is to um to show them that they that they, they're being counted on to pass these subjects. So unless you pass a subject that um um pass that your all of your subjects mm -hmm. that you would be able to move up to the next level. And I think that would motivate a lot of them to say, boy, I do want to be in a class with smaller children than myself because I didn't take, um, I didn't take, take, what the word I'm looking for? Um, like I didn't do well in this class because of my, of my behavior or because I wasn't listening or what have you. So that would make them more conscious that to get to that back to that level or to a higher level they have to study they have to listen they have to participate in class and do the classwork mm -hmm. so i think our, our Cayman, um children would benefit from repeating if they're not if they don't pass instead of just pushing them through the education system and they're coming out of school with not knowing nothing not learning anything and just robbing, killing, drugs, and what have you. I think we need to take a special... Um, so let me let me ask you a question, right? You've heard me talking about this Yolanda Ford report uh, that was done, oh my God, what is that, 20 years ago now or whatever, which talks about what the elements are uh, that lead to criminality in the Cayman Islands. And in that report, it says that the number one factor is parenting, the parents and the family household. So we're blaming education, we're blaming the police, we're blaming the politicians, we're blaming everybody else. But here we have an independent report that we paid probably thousands upon thousands of dollars for that said, actually, the real problem is you parents and in your households. And the lack of just, uh, you know, a moral compass, a standard, anything. And so the children are learning their criminal behavior and uh, their mm -hmm. attitudes and everything else. From mm -hmm. their parents and from the families That's that they true. come from. That is true. People can't send their kids to school and expect the teachers to fix them when they're not fixing them at home. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you got to And, and you the other thing parent. is, you know, <laughs> you, you try to hold some kids back. The next thing you have is some parent flying up in your face trying to assault you because you said where well, your child needs remedial help, your child needs attention. We can't advance your child to the next grade. Uh, that'd be the day that you see a teacher get assaulted in the Cayman Islands. That, I'm, that, I'm just, that is I'm true. I, I'm, 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 I understand what you're saying, but it's all about um, educating or, 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 or parents that this is for the best interest of your child. Why we put this child to repeat? Because in, in if the parents sound in mind, would realize and understand, should realize and understand and agree with the teacher it's the best for their child or their children. Mm. But I do agree with you. It has to start from at home. Mm -hmm. It has to start from at home because then it was just a couple of days ago. I was saying, oh my gosh, look at all this shooting going on, especially here in Windsor Park. Mm -hmm. You look at the kids in this yard. Look at the amount of kids and what they're seeing, what they are learning, what they're hearing. Mm -hmm. You understand, and of course they're gonna go to school. They're gonna come on the community mm -hmm. and 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 replay those same actions. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, you just understand? just a couple uh, weeks ago now, it might have been last weekend even. We had um, a shooting there in Windsor Park, and you know I was talking about it just in the perspective of how these poor children growing up in that environment who witnessed exactly. this. I thought to myself, mm -hmm. my God. How, mm -hmm. how will those children be impacted by actually seeing somebody shot? I mean, that has to be traumatic. Yep. Nobody's talking yep. about, you know, getting them any help or anything. Someone actually sent a message and they said, um, I was trying to find the messages now, but they said, you know, Sandy, the truth of the matter is they witnessed, um, or I can't remember if they said they did, or they know someone who witnessed the murder. I think they said they did. And they said, you know, it's it, to this day, they are traumatized by having seen someone murdered. And it's not something that you ever, in, in fact, get over. And so, no. um, again, the environment that these kids are being brought up in, dried up in, you know, the parents mm -hmm. setting this kind of example of violence, mm -hmm. of, you know, somebody doesn't, or somebody does something that offends you that you don't like, what you do is you shoot them, you stab them, you beat them up. Uh, yeah. How do we expect these children to be functional and good members of this community when that's what they're being exposed totally to on agree. a daily basis? Yeah. I 100% agree with you. It's I wish so I could true. find the... Um, is... I wish I could find the this message. If the person's listening to the program, uh, do message me again because yeah. I can't put my hand... I it, think it, it is, WhatsApp, it is but, so... It's it's just horrible. It is so true. We as parents needs to be mindful of who we are letting into our space. What kind of 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 um people we are and behavior we are letting into our space around our children. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't think about that. They only think about oh having fun and drinking and 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 gambling and 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 getting high and doing this and doing that and 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 doesn't give a hoot about their kids, mm -hmm. which is sad. Mm -hmm. It is sad. You want to party? Get someone to mind your kids and go to the nightclub and party. Well, maybe you do. No, your, shouldn't well, maybe not be in you front of your, your kids. Um, yeah, maybe you do your partying, you know, before you decide to have kids. Because this is the other thing: is people exactly. having kids too young, exactly. and you know, they still they still want to live that. I'm 21 and free, and um, what, what do they call it? YOLO. You only live once. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're trying you to live their once. best life. Miss yep. uh, Miss mm -hmm. Romelia, thank you so much for the call and the conversation. It's always good to hear from you. You're most welcome. All right, my dear. Have a good one. Okay, you do. God bless. All right, folks. So some very um, good comments there. Uh, Elaine says, Cayman and children are spoiled brats. <laughs> mm -mm. A bit of truth bombs here this morning. Uh, Melissa says, so true, Sandy. Bad parenting. Charles, good morning. Says only a handful of young Cayman and people would want to be a police officer. The ones that desire to become a police are already in the force. So he's saying it's not that many that want to be there. Um, Aline agrees that parenting is the problem. Uh, Karen says, why are we blame everything? We should try to fix the issue than blaming everything. Well, I mean, you have to discuss where the issues I think come from. And then of course that hopefully will lead you to some solutions. But I agree, Karen, that we spend an inordinate amount of time, um, talking about the issues, but when it comes to solutions, not so much so. 
Um, I think part of that is because it's just easier to talk about an issue as opposed to actually finding a solution. Folks, at 936-2626 is the telephone number. You're free to call in. Let's go ahead and take a brief commercial break here this morning. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. We're going to start talking about, talking about criminals. Let's talk about the BVI situation because guess what, folks? Criminals come in all shapes and sizes, apparently. Mm-mm-mm. What a hot mess. At Innovative Building Products, we provide professional builders and homeowners with the highest quality materials from top brands worldwide. Tiling tools, waterproofing systems, fin sets, self-levelers, grout, along with porcelain floor and wall tiles. Our products are 100% guaranteed, promise 100% satisfaction, and beat competitor pricing. Pallets of materials are ready to go. Quick and easy convenience to get you in and out within five minutes. Morning, that it is an offense before we move on to our next conversation. It is an offense for you to aid in a bet. And if you're helping a criminal, um, the police are saying that you will be held to account. So um, please, folks, know the law. Your, your ignorance of the law actually has nothing to do with whether or not you will be he- held to account. But here is what the police said in relation to um, a young lady who they had in their uh, comments yesterday that they had actually warned about helping. They said they actually warned the police, uh, warned this young lady about helping this particular individual. And she did so anyway. Now, 33 years old, she's 33 and he's 20. What? He's pretty, um, she's a little bit older than him. He's in his 20s. I had to, when I read that, I thought, who is this woman? Like, at 33, you should be trying to get your life together. You should be trying to do better. Um, what are you doing with a 25-year-old? You know, most men are not that mature in any event. You might want to go a little bit older and find someone of a better caliber, but she didn't. And so she's been arrested um, on suspicion of aiding and abetting. Now, this arrest is in relation to the murder of Mr. Harry Elliott. So I don't know if she, um, you know, I don't know how she helped him, if she was hiding him or what she was doing, but I am glad that the police are sending a very strong message that if you do this, you will be arrested and you will be charged. And you're looking at a 10 year sentence. I say, you know what? I don't know who she is, but throw the book at her and give her the full 10 years. This should be one of those things, again, that our legislators should make a mandatory sentence. If you aid and abet a criminal and you're convicted of that, mandatory 10 years in jail. I bet you all, couple of y'all think twice now about doing it, wouldn't you? Here's what the RCA APS had to say on this. Uh, Commissioner alluded to one arrest for Monday night's murder last night. We arrested a female with that suspect for harboring him for assisting him. Mm -hmm. That female had been warned not to offer any aid or assistance to that individual because he was wanted. Mm -hmm. And when we caught him, he was with her. So people in the community are acting inappropriately and helping these criminals. That has got to stop. Please, please, everybody come forward, stop these criminals Mm -hmm. performing these acts and stand up, give evidence, and we will be able to make Cayman safe. So, folks, um, it is interesting that on the one hand, y'all are claiming that you're afraid to help the police and you don't want your name to be called up and stuff and whatever, right? If it's true, that's certainly a legitimate um, reason. But what would be the reason for people harboring criminals and actually helping criminal elements in this country? Hmm. To me, this speaks to the fact that we have a lot of criminality here in this country and a lot of shadiness, and people are simply not doing the right thing just because. Hmm. And yet we blame the police. I think there's a lot of blame to go around and, um, you know, people need to look at the person in the mirror. So harboring someone after you've been told by the police, don't do it. They must have still found him hiding out at her place. Uh -uh. Folks, when it comes down to it, um, you know, just don't encourage these people to come to you. They'll they'll find somebody else to go to, I'm sure. 
All right, Charles says they sure are. Why well, you think the number of business now mash up already? Um, we did ask about that. I think that this might have been. I can't remember if it was during during the press conference because we did ask a few follow up questions afterwards. They did have a meeting, another meeting uh, that they were attending after the press conference. I think that they were a little bit pressed for time. But having said that, they said that this has been an area of concern for quite some time and there is something in the works in terms of legislation at the policy level. So it's actually the legislators who need to tighten up the law as it comes to um, you know, prosecuting people who are into the illegal gambling and the number selling. And the other thing that they said that I was a bit taken aback by that I didn't know, that's why you gotta go to these things every once in a while, is that apparently, um, Number sellers are being, uh, what was the word he used? They're being um, uh, extorted. So the criminals are like, if you don't pay us, you know, whatever, we're going to come and rob you. Or we're going to set you up to be robbed and so forth. I was like, what? That's a thing in Cayman, like extortion? No, sir. Janetta says that's true. The caller is speaking true facts. Charlene says through hiring and screening, that needs to happen within hiring process of her police department in specific going back in going back into a few years well and the problems within our country may just be properly addressed well i mean we don't want to hire you know unsavory uh, individuals into the rcips i think that that does happen although i don't necessarily think it's the vast majority um, you find that a lot of people come here because in their own countries, they can't get a job or they've been expelled out of the force or they're no longer wanted. And they find the process of getting a job uh, with the RCIPS to be a lot easier. And so we're not necessarily bringing in the most qualified individuals sometimes um, from our neighboring countries in particular. And we are certainly uh, sometimes also bringing in people who are shady AF, who just happen to be police officers. So uh, Melicia says, I stand to be corrected is only Jamaican police officers here. I don't agree totally with the caller. So no, I mean, it's not just Jamaican police officers, but Jamaican police officers do make up a large portion of the police force. So it's probably just a numbers game, really. Um, and again, I stand by the position that the vast majority of the RCIPS officers are good men and women who are really trying their best. And it's just the one or two um bad apples that make everybody look bad. Mm -mm. So Karen says that's where we went, where we're wrong too. Why should we segregate the service? I know good Jamaican officers, good Caymanian officers, good uh, Barbados officers, good UK officers. We need to stop the separation. That's why our children don't want to join because what we as Caymanians are talking these things um, in the children's ears. And I agree, Karen. I'm with you there. It's not about separating um, the force in any way, shape or form. But I think that sometimes if the force is unbalanced, um, it, it can cause some, some glaring issues as well. All right, so let's move on. Olive, thank you so much. Um, she says, I was cheering for this caller until she started pointing the finger. Many years ago when I just come to Cayman, I was robbed um, and the police came. I was told not to go to court because the police who take the report was the uncle of one of the robbers. Uncle what? Uh, it was three young Cayman and guys. I just come to Cayman and I didn't even have a full understanding of how things go. So I didn't go any further with it. Wow. Yeah. I, I also believe um, there is an element of Caymanians, um, you know, nepotism in a lot of areas, but nepotism and crime fighting and police uh, matters is a very, very serious thing. So Miss Olive, I'm very sorry that that happened to you. And I completely believe you. And I think that there are uh, people on the police force who will take a certain position because of who they're connected to and who their family to and all that sort of stuff. Hmm. What a mess. Mm -mm. All right. Um, Miss uh, Janetta says there has to be transparency between parents and teachers in regards to the child. Uh, what do you think about music and Hollywood and video games? Uh, Damien, that's probably an, an, another conversation. But I think, again, it comes down to parenting. The parents have to control what their children are being exposed to. Um, Karen says at least 75% of Caymanians are working and hold a steady job. 
Yep. All right. So let's move on. Um, Dean Shillette says immigration is the only problem that we have in Cayman. Don't we wish? <laughs> there, that's not the only problem. We got a lot of problems. So let's just leave that one alone. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. Lots of comments here. Gabby, parents need to get their children involved in the community, scouts, cadet, brownies, uh, youth groups, et cetera. Um, Karen says, what happened to family time, not media? That should be restricted. Sonia, good morning to all. She says, no matter which country the officers are from, you have good and bad in every police force on the force, on the face of the earth. You've got seven brothers, seven different minds. Nobody can stop anyone to progress in life if you have determination. There was an incident with a couple and our Caymanian police came and took statements. Seemed like one of the officers and the young man that was involved knew each other and he was not uh, on the scene when the officers came, was just a lady and after the officer, sorry, he got cut off. Um, you listen, it's it's good and bad all over. I have seen Caymanians, uh, even the situation in West Bay with Mike Adam and his uh, ongoing land dispute. That's a Caymanian who was there telling Mike Adams and his family to just listen to this Johnny come lately from New Jersey who claims he has Cayman status. Uh, listen to him and just let him determine what happens to access point that has existed for 25 years. That was not a Jamaican officer. That was not a Honduran officer. That was not an English officer. That was a born, bred, multi-generational Caymanian related to the friggin' premier at the time of the country. So yeah, our, problem, our, our people are indeed part of the problem. Uh -uh. Let's move on. BVI premiere. Oh, oh, oh. I don't know the dude, but boy, he not too bright. Listen, folks, what year are we now living in? 2022? There's still a 21st century, right? In my mind, you are stupid. And yes, I'm going to use that word. Now, if my daughter wasn't was here, I couldn't say the word. I wouldn't want her to hear me calling somebody stupid. But you are stupid. When you decide, as a premier of a country, the British Virgin Islands, that you are going to get involved in, well, cocaine smuggling, money laundering, meeting with people who say that they are part of the Mexican Sinaloa cartel, one of the most dangerous criminal groups in the entire world? Child, is anybody call me and be like, oh, we're part of the Mexican Sinaloa cartel. Can we meet with you? I would hang up that phone so freaking fast. I'd be like, who? Not me. Meet with who? You gotta be crazy. What? What's this guy thinking? What's his, what's his name? Um, Andrew Alturo Fahi? Is that how he pronounces his name? Lord Jehovah, how did this man become the premier of BVI? They must be so embarrassed this morning. And this story is trending all over the place, child. Big shout out to the Miami Herald. They were the first ones to break it. And we got it in short order. And of course, we were the first ones that came out and said, have it up. This is just a mess. So here's what we know. And we have the full report here, by the way. We have the 19-page indictment document. Ooh, honey, chill. Let us look at this. Hi. What a mess. I need my hot mess button right, right about now. What a hot mess, folks. What a hot mess. Mm -mm. Let's look at this. All 19 pages of it. Wow. Oh, uh -uh. I, 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 my, my brain is just like, this is crazy on so many different levels. All right. Let's have a look at the document. Mm -mm. This is the indictment document. United States District Court, Southern District of Florida. Mm, mm, mm. United States of America versus Andrew Alturo Fahi, a.k.a. head coach, a.k.a. coach. <laughs> he actually had an alias. What a mess. And Olenveen Pickering Maynard, a.k.a. Rose, a.k.a. P. That's the port director. 
Lord Jesus. And Kadeem Stephen Maynard, a.k.a. Blacka. Wow. These are the defendants. Hmm? Criminal cover sheet. Signed by uh, one Antonio Gonzalez, United States Attorney. Frederick Shadley, Assistant United States Attorney. They all got it here, Jim. Let's look at the details. Criminal complaint by telephone and other reliable electronic means. I'm telling y'all, the telephone gonna mess y'all up. What's the name of that song? Telephone thing, mash up my life. Right. So the indictment was signed. Um, these documents were signed yesterday. Um, listen to this. They actually did the indictment paperwork by FaceTime. <laughs> COVID has changed the world. You don't need to show up in court anymore. They're like, yes, just sign these documents virtually. Let's do it by FaceTime. Special agent of the DEA. And this is what we know. This person, Shad Ashleman, being duly sworn, disposed as follows. Um, he's a special agent with the United States Department of Justice, Drug Enforcement Administration since 2004, currently assigned to the DEA Miami Field Division, High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, Lord have mercy, Task Force Group 41, criminal investigator within the United States, Talk, talks about how he's, you know, empowered to do that legally. Based on information contained in this affidavit, I respectfully submit that there's a probable cause for the issuance of a criminal complaint charging Andrew Otoro Fahi, a.k.a. head coach, a.k.a. coach, uh, Olenveen Pickering, Maynard, a.k.a. Rose, a.k.a. P, and Kadeem Stephen May Maynard, which is his son, by the way, a.k.a. Blanca, as follows. Conspiracy to import five kilos, five kilograms or more, of a mixture and substance contained, containing a detectable amount of cocaine in violation of blah, blah, blah. Conspiracy to launder money in violation of blah, blah, blah. The facts set out in the affidavit are based on my personal knowledge and observations. And let's go down a little bit further because this is the background information now. Mm. So it says here that based on the information provided by the Department of Justice Office of International Affairs, I know that Section 80 of the Criminal Code of BVI makes it an offense for public official to directly or indirectly solicit, accept, or obtain a gratification for doing or abstaining from an act in the execution of his duties or facilitated by his functions or duties, expediting, delaying, hindering, or preventing the performance of an act by himself, or any other public official, expediting, delaying, hindering, or preventing another person in the transaction of business with a public body, and so on. Uh -huh. Beginning on or about October the 16th, 2021, a DEA confidential source had several meetings with a group of self-proclaimed Lebanese Hezbollah operative. Lord Jesus. We got the Colombians in the mix, uh, we got the Lebanese Hezbollah operatives in the mix hmm? who stated that they had business ties to South Florida and the Middle East. These meetings occurred on the island of Tortola in the British Virgin Islands. Yep. Through the course of these meetings, the CS requested assistance from the Lebanese group to facilitate the use of Tortola as a temporary storage port for drugs, a.k.a. cocaine, transported from Colombia via boat and destined for the United States. These efforts would also include the subsequent laundering of drug proceeds. The Lebanese group agreed to assist the CS by facilitating introductions to senior members of the BVI government who would offer protection to the CS's activities, but would require payment for their assistance. Let me just pause right there. This is what it's all about, right? Greed. A member of the Lebanese group told the CS that he would approach the head of security for Andre Fahi and try to set up a meeting. Fahi was and is the premier of the BVI. Who's head of his security, I wonder? Anyway, a member of the Lebanese group also told the CS that he owned Alenveen Maynard. <laughs> Maynard being the managing director of the BVI Ports Authority. Later, members of the Lebanese group told the CS that they had contacted Maynard 
And she agreed to meet with the CS, but she wanted an upfront payment. Oh, Maynard is a woman? Wait a minute. This um, Olivine Maynard, the head of the port, is a woman? Oh, Jesus. This just got that much more interesting. I thought that was a man for some reason. All right, well, woman or not, let's continue. On and about March the 16th, 2022, the CS met, met with Kadeem Maynard, Kadeem, who is the son of Olivine Maynard, and they met on the island of Tortola, and the meeting, meeting was audio recorded. During this initial meeting, Kadeem explained that he and his mother had been uh, waiting for the meeting with the CS and that they had previously been contacted by members of the Lebanese group. According to Kadeem, he was glad to see the CS because they had already started to put things in place and make connections based on their conversations with the Lebanese group. The CS and Kadeem exchanged numbers to allow for future communications. During their discussion, the CS explained that the CS had been doing this, a reference to drug trafficking, for a long time. Kareem responded that he had been doing it for 20 years. Oh, my God. You can just meet somebody and all of a sudden let out the cat out of the bag that you've been doing this for 20 years. Boy, these people don't got no sense in BVI. You know, I always say that criminals are not really that bright, but anyway. The CS explained to Kadeem that he was from Mexico and that he wanted to meet with Maynard. The CS told Kadeem that he was a fixer and that he needed to reach an agreement with Maynard. Kadeem responded that he would set something up and that he and Maynard had already been waiting on the CS. Wow. Following the meeting, the CS and Kadeem exchanged text messages via WhatsApp to agree a meeting with Maynard and Kadeem on the island of St. Thomas in the British Virgin Islands. So on and about March 20th, 2022, the CS met with Kadeem and Maynard in St. Thomas. The meeting was audio and video recorded. Woo! Proper sting operation here, folks. The CS told them that he was a member of the Sinaloa cartel and requested their help moving thousands of kilos of cocaine from Colombia through Tortola to Puerto Rico with the destination of Miami and then New York. Mm -hmm. The CS made it clear that the CS did not wish to import the drugs to Tortola for sale. <coughs> Sorry. But the no cocaine uh, would leave the container while in port. Okay, so it's just a transit position, basically. The CS also required protection and safe passage for the container for a 24 to 48 hour period until the window would open when it could be taken to Puerto Rico. My apologies, a little tickle there in the throat. Maynard asked, if you want it to be done legally so nobody would come around, question mark. <laughs> How can it be done legally? You're doing an illegal act. Anyway, the CS responded that uh, he needed the paperwork and Maynard said, this is where I can assist. We need different licenses, which I can get. So we can process your paperwork so you can come into the territory for a couple of days and then move on. That is easy. Wow. Mm -hmm. The CS explained that his organizations had kitchens, um, which are cocaine laboratories in Colombia. So they had a very cheap and sustainable product. He asked them the price of a kilo on the island and Kadeem responded $10,000. Now, let me just pause there. For him to know what the price of a kilo of cocaine is on his island, um, he really must know. He, he must really be in the business for true. The CS... Um, explained that he could get the product to Tortola for roughly $4,000, but it would sell for twenty six to 28000 a kilo in Miami or thirty two to 38000 in New York. The CS offered them a percentage of everything sold in the United States and asked how he would get the money back to them in the BVI. Maynard responded, what we do is set up shell companies. Mm, he sounded like a real expert. During this portion of the conversation, Kadeem confirmed that they had already developed a plan to deal with customs and that they had determined that they had to set up a business as a shipping agent, then they would be good to go. Hmm. Maynard explained that she had already started looking into different licenses, adding, you have to legitimize what you're doing. Wow. 
While discussing the CS's membership in the Sinaloa cartel, Kadim again explained that he had previously been involved in drug trafficking, but did not use the product. OMG. Kadim stated that he would be interested uh, in receiving product for his help, and the CS said that he thought that his bosses would agree to that arrangement. Just a little bit more, because this is, this is so interesting. The party has also discussed the need to meet with Fahi and another BVI government official in describing Fahi Maynard said, I know the man. If he sees an opportunity, he will take it. I know the type of person he is, so I know he will take the opportunity. Wow. As to herself, Maynard said, if you come to me and I don't want to do it, I say, hey, I'm not interested. Or if I'm interested, I will say I'm interested. The CS then proposed a test run of 3,000 kilos of cocaine on a big boat following the route described above. He said that he would need a license, and after the test run, they would do four months of shipments. The parties again discussed the need to involve Fahi and would, uh, and government official number one, so they're not naming that individual. With regard to Maynard, Kadim said she knows the premier, he's down with her, so she can go to him at any time, and he would say, okay. Maynard added, you see, with my premier, he's a little crook sometimes. He's not always straight. Wow. No, sir. At the end of the meeting, the CS provided Maynard with a bag containing $10,000 in U.S. currency, saying it was a gesture of good faith. Maynard responded that she would start her homework tomorrow. Mm. Following the meeting, Kadim was uh, established as the point of contact with Maynard and later Fahi. His contacts with the CS would primarily happen via WhatsApp. On March 21st, Kadim texts the CS that he would be meeting with the head coach, a.k.a. Fahi, the next day. On or about March 22nd, the CS had a phone call with Maynard and Kadim, and that phone call was also audio recorded. From the call, it was apparent that Maynard and Kadim had discussed the CS proposals with Fahi. Remember, now that's the premier of BVI. They said that they had spoken with Fahi, and he was very interested in working with the CS. Fahi said he needed an upfront payment of $500,000, half a million, and that he would handle the ports and airports. Maynard further explained that Fahi would need some money to get government official number one on their side. Maynard said that she dropped off the business license application to aid their scheme and that Fahi had agreed to help her with the ports aspect of the plan. Further, Maynard explained that Fahi gave her code words to use when she wanted to meet with him about this scheme. The parties then agreed to set up a meeting for April the 7th and the CS thanked Maynard and responded, you're my brother now. I'll be there with you every step of the way. No, sir. After that call, the CS continued to exchange text messages with Kadeem, where they discussed their side deal by which the CS would provide Kadeem with his own kilos for distribution. So he was actually going to take the drugs and distribute it on BVI in his, in his own country? Well, he said he's been in the business for 20 years, so I guess we shouldn't be surprised, right? Mm -mm. On and about March the 31st, the CS had a phone call with Kadeem and Maynard. That call was audio recorded. Maynard confirmed that Fahi wanted to work with the CS, but that he also wanted some information about the CS that, so that he could make the deal appear legitimate and secure. Maynard and Kadim explained that Fahi was skittish because uh, his government had been subject to an audit. Mm. Kadim added, however, that he um, had incriminating information on Fahi. Oh, my goodness. This, is, this has got to be a movie soon. Lifetime? HBO, where are you? The CS asked if Fahi understood what the plan was and if he knew what the CS wanted to bring, and Kadim responded, yes, yes, yes. They then confirmed a plan to arrange a phone call with Fahi prior to their April the 7th, 2022 meeting. So on and about April the 1st, April Fool's Day, the CS had a phone call with Kadim, Maynard, and Fahi. That call was audio recorded. During the call, they discussed the information that Fahi had previously requested of the CS. Fahi explained that he had to be cautious to make sure that the CS wasn't law enforcement. <laughs> he told the CS, it took me 20 years to get here, and I don't want to leave in 20 minutes. 
the CS then said he was a fixer from Mexico and that he had a business proposition for Fahi. They agreed that they would go forward in the plan meeting uh, with a plan meeting on April the 7th. After the phone call on April the 1st, CS and Kadeem exchanged a series of WhatsApp messages and CS asked any comment from HC about myself on the call. Kadeem responded, he said he feels much comfortable now and we're going forward. He's going to make sure you're safe and whatever you want, try to make sure you have what you need. Just want to ensure the funds is for real. So on April the 7th, the CS arrived in Tortola and met with Kadeem and Maynard. The meeting was audio recorded. They told the CS that they would be picked up and driven to a meeting with Fahi. A vehicle arrived at their location and picked up Maynard and the FS. Fahi was in the front passenger seat. Kadim rode in a separate vehicle. The drive to the meeting location took over an hour. Mm. While driving, Fahi compl complained that the British didn't pay him much. The car eventually arrived at a large, very nice stone house. Kadim served as security outside the meeting along with others. Fahi, Maynard, and the CS entered the home and sat down to talk. The meeting was audio recorded. During the meeting, the CS told Fahi that he was employed by people in Mexico and requested use of the ports of Tortola for free passage of 3,000 kilos of cocaine at a time. The cocaine would come from Colombia to BVI to Puerto Rico and then to Miami, New York. The cocaine would be packaged in construction material in five kilo buckets of waterproofing paint. That material would not test positive for cocaine, but the cocaine would later be extracted over the course of about four days in either Puerto Rico or Miami. The CS explained that the cost of the kilos in Colombia, uh, explained the cost of kilos and that his organization worked with the FARC, and you guys know who the FARC are in Colombia, um, to buy land for the cultivation of cocaine. The CS explained the production costs in Colombia, $350 to $400 a kilo, and the sale prices for kilo in Miami, and New York, and the CS proposed paying Fahi and Maynard a percentage of his cocaine sales in exchange for their help passing the cocaine through their ports. He asked Fahi what percentage he wanted, and he deferred to the CS regarding the appropriate percentage. The CS then offered him 12% of the value of the cocaine sold in the United States. He pulled out a calculator, so Fahi now, the premier, pulled out a calculator, and ran 3,000 kilos times 26,000, which is the Miami price, the total was $78 million? What? Mm, that's a lot of money. Fahi then calculated that 10% of $78 million would be $7.8 million, and he agreed to allow the CS to use the ports uh, to ship his cocaine, and said that Maynard had the licenses for the companies that the CS would need. Fahi added, so that path there is clear, the UI first one will be shipping, will be the shipping. She told me she's putting through the license to make sure they get through one path. The other path to the license that I'm meeting with the location, I'm going to get that, going to get that sorted. In exchange for their efforts, Fahi requested a $500,000 upfront payment, and the CS explained that he would provide additional money for them at a future meeting in Miami. The CS offered to help fund Fahi's re-election campaign and asked that Fahi allow the CS to have a hand in choosing Fahi's eventual successor. What? To ensure the, continue, the continuity of their drug operations. The CS asked to do a 3,000 kilo test run to Miami, which would be followed by four months of 3,000 kilo loads uh, coming through the island two or three times a month. Then they would break for a number of months before resuming again. Fahi agreed to that proposal. When the parties were finished discussing the specifics of the cocaine shipment, the CS said, that part is good, right? Fahi said, yes. The CS then provided Fahi with $20,000 in cash saying this is a good faith gift to seal we have an agreement. Mm -mm. In addition to the drug transports, the CS uh, proposed that they would organize seizures of bad drugs and money by Fahi in the BVI so that they could avoid suspicion and make it look like Fahi was fighting drug trafficking. 
Fahi laughed and said the CS had thought of everything. <laughs> Fahi asked if the CS was an undercover and the CS responded in a way that reassured Fahi he was not. As part of that response, the CS explained to Fahi, well, first of all, you're not touching anything. Fahi replied, I will touch one thing, the money. In explaining why he was concerned with law enforcement, Fahi said that this told the CS that the British had been trying for years to get him out of office. <laughs> he said, I have plenty of people and I don't sell them out to the British with their plans. Their plans are to catch all the people like what you said. They always want to capture people. But me, I see what they're doing and I protect the people. Fahi then added that the CS had responded perfectly to his question about law enforcement. The CS responded, I understand. And I have no problem with your question. And thank you that you understand. It's just trust. We can do it. We cannot and or we cannot and we'll be friends. So we're good on that matter. Fahi responded, yes. Mm -mm. So they were trying to get somebody else in this because it keeps talking about government official one who they don't name. But Fahi said that that person had many employers um, and it's believed to be a reference to drug traffickers who pay or employ government official one to do their bidding. So Fahi explained that the best approach was just to pay government official one. Towards the end of the meeting, Fahi asked Maynard to leave the room, which he did. And Fahi told the CS that he also needed $83,000 in cash to pay back a debt he owed to someone in Senegal. <laughs> what the heck? The CS agreed to help him with that issue, and they arranged the following. The CS, Maynard, and Fahi would meet in Miami on April the 27th. The CS would leave the $700,000 cash in a private jet at the Opelaka airport that would be retrieved by Nick Maynard and an unknown individual on April the 28th, be flown back to BVI, and Fahi would fly to join the CS in St. Martin on May the 2nd, where they would meet the man from Senegal and pay the debt off on behalf of Fahi. Following the meeting, the CS continued to communicate with Kadim regarding the side deal through which Kadim would plan to receive 60 kilos of cocaine a week. Further, they coordinated the arrival of the private jet with the $700,000 from Miami to BVI. Uh, Kadim had control of officials at the airport and confirmed that they would allow the plane to land. This is just so unbelievable. So on April the 7th, remember now, um, our, our Minister of Tourism and Transport was there as well as a lot of other representatives around the world for this, um, this cruise ship con convention that they were having while Port Kenneth is there um, learning about cruise ships and you know what the plan is moving forward. Uh, here's BVI doing their side deals and about to get arrested. So on April the 27th, the CS and the DEA undercover officer met with Maynard in Miami to discuss their arrangement and the side deal that her son had planned with the CS. They discussed the cocaine for, for Kadim and how 20 of every 60 kilos belonged to the CS. The CS explained that cocaine would start coming from St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands to BVI on April the 30th. Mm -mm -mm. She then called her son, put him on speakerphone. On the phone, Kadim asked Maynard to give the CS a paper that contained three coordinates which were drop points for the delivery of the cocaine to Kadim. Maynard, Maynard complied and provided that paper to the CS. Wow. Uh, the CS asked Kareem what he felt was a good price for Kadim to pay for the cocaine, and he ag eventually agreed at 11000 per kilo for a total of $220,000. So the CS told him to keep that money for the payment to law enforcement officers on Tortola, Kadim responded that he already had two officers on his payroll. You check that out. The parties next discuss how to arrange for the delivery of the drugs from St. Thomas to Tortola. The CS asked Kadim to meet the CS's sister in St. Thomas on April the 28th, and she would have a satellite phone and $30,000 to provide for payment uh, to those in Tortola that would help with their scheme. He agreed and said he would take his boat over that morning and then hung up the phone with Kadim, and they continued speaking. So they're setting up shell companies for the drugs and money they'd be receiving as part of their plan for Fahi. 
there was a reference to the large amount of money that CS had agreed to provide Maynard and Fahi. And Maynard said yes and told the CS they would not need to remove anything from the drug boat and that they would not need to enter the port. The CS then asked about government official one and Maynard say that Fahi would clear it with him. Well, I don't know who government official one is. Doesn't look like he's been arrested yet, but he should be shaking in his boots. Uh, the CS then asked Maynard if she had accounts available in the US that she could use to receive her money from their plan. And she answered that Kadeem owned a real estate company in Florida with accounts that could be used. Wow. The parties then discuss government official one how that official was good friends with Fahi and that official was close friends with a well-known drug trafficker on the island. Maynard then provided paperwork to the CS about a plane company they used um, from the U.S. to bring drug money into BVI, secreted in the plane. She said that the company wanted to do business with the CS. The CS replied that he was looking forward to meeting them, and the meeting concluded shortly thereafter. So on the 27th, they met with Fahi at the same hotel where they met with Maynard earlier. The meeting was audio recorded. On arrival, Fahi was located in the lobby along with RS. They exchanged introductions. And then Maynard arrived and took them to the conference room that she had rented. Once in the conference room, uh, Fahi asked the ladies to leave so that only Fahi, the CS, and the UC were present. Fahi then asked the CS to start with a prayer. What the hell? You can't make this stuff up. And then immediately began to speak about the money that he needed to pay the man from Senegal. Yes, because the Lord is going to help you in this situation. During their upcoming meeting in St. Martin, Fahi said that they needed to make the payment on May the 3rd. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, my goodness. Mm -mm. When he was asked about why he needed to pay this, he said that the man... He'd known him for years, and the man had fixed some political issues for him. Only God knows what that means. And the payment was for fixing those political issues. Wow. Huh. All right. Um, unbelievable. It, it does go on, folks. It, it's quite, quite interesting. Um, but the end result is that... Um, Listen to Fahi. He wanted to build companies and bank accounts, including a line of credit for around $300,000. <sighs> Unbelievable. So, um, the bottom line here, folks, is the premier of BVI has now been arrested, along with his port director and her son. And they're to appear in a Miami federal court this afternoon for their first court appearance. Greed, greed, greed. I mean, but they seem like they were really, this was some deep planning. So Fahi has a residence in South Florida. They arrived on the 28th to pick him up and transport him to the airport. Uh, their interactions were again recorded. Upon arrival at the airport, CS stated that he had something to show Fahi, and he took him to the plane destined for the BVI that they'd spoken about the night before. They exited the CS's car and entered the aircraft, and in the back of the plane, he showed Fahi designer shopping bags containing the $700,000 for Fahi and Maynard. The UC explained that the money would be packaged in a suitcase like Fahi had requested, and they wanted him to see it first in person to confirm that it was paid. Shortly thereafter, the par parties exited the plane and Fahi was subsequently arrested. Fahi confirms that he was, in fact, Andrew Fahi and asks, why am I getting arrested? I don't have any money or drugs. <laughs> Later that morning, April 28th, again, this all went down yesterday, the CS and UC picked up Maynard at, from the same hotel in Miami, and these interactions were audio and video recorded. The parties drove together from the hotel to the Apalaka executive airport and upon arrival the parties walked on the tarmac and towards the private jet they entered the jet same thing they um showed them the money said it was a whole seven hundred thousand dollars uh the cs provided maynard her two hundred thousand dollars and said it was her payment he then explained that the rest of the money was for fahi and that it was very important to the cs's organization that the money be kept secure 
The CS told Maynard and RS that the money would be further packaged and hidden prior to the flight. As she exited the plane, she was arrested by law enforcement. Wow. There you have it, folks. Um, this is reads like something out of a novel. It is absolutely unbelievable. Marshall says Columbia is the headquarters for hardcore drugs, so you know they would have been involved. Um, Damien says Peru now, but U.S. doing business with them now. I don't know what that what that means. Um, Marshall says the premier of the BVI has been involved for a long time. He is just now getting caught. And look where he was caught in the U.S. He's facing some serious time in prison. Hmm. Why is it always about Caymanians? Okay, Priscilla, I think we're in a different conversation now. Uh, Marshall says they're all a bunch of greedy people. Uh, locked them up for many years. Now that they're caught, some are singing like a bird. Well, I am interested in who... Uh, government official number one is because it looks like that person has not yet been arrested. So I think some additional arrests may fall from this. Denver says some same type of operation went on here with the gold transshipment, transshipment, sorry, with top crime fraud department and police. Mm -mm. Jess says, well, who the hell you think put these islands on the map? I'm I'm surprised that well I don't know this official I don't know the premier BVI but I'm surprised that obviously he he was thinking oh could this be a setup but really in this day and age think everything's a setup and just don't be a criminal Dean says all this is happening right under the UK's nose and the whole island is buy out well I mean can you blame the UK when they start to take a certain position about their overseas territories. Damon says, why would they want to meet the guy from Senegal and care about payment? Red flag. I don't know. I don't know how these criminals think. Uh, most drug lords have a few police officers, judges, and lawyers on their payroll. Um, Dean says the police commission, governor of BVI, were living on the moon. So I am curious when he talked about the guy in Senegal fixing something for him. What did that mean? So Karen says Senegal, uh, world's second best hackers. Oh. And you remember now the port director said she had stuff on the premiere. So it looks like people, uh, lots going on there in the BVI, fixing political issues. I, I, I would love to know what that means. Um, oh, Cher Reynolds said is the Tortuga robbery going to court again today. Okay, update on that. Thank you so much, uh, Cher Reynolds, for that. We did inquire because we needed to know. That was the one that was, I was like, isn't that going on today? So what we've been told, this is um, Kaznik Cupid, whatever her name is, Eve High Voltage is her street name. Uh, her sentencing hearing is now set for May the 6th because her defense attorney is, an, uh, is in an ongoing trial today. So we'll have to wait until May the 6th to um, get the details on what her sentencing will be. But don't worry, honey child, I'm gonna put that in my calendar before I leave here today. Cause May the 6th, what day of the week is that? Um, April, oh gosh, what did I just do with the date? Hold on now. Um, oh, I somehow closed it out of my, this this new um, Windows what is this, 11 is a little bit, how do I go to April? Oh, there we go. April, May. May the 6th is a Friday. Mm -hmm. So that's a good day. We will be there. Uh, Marshall says, of course, it was a big setup. Um, diplomatic immunity for who? The premier? I don't think so. All right, folks. Um, guess what? That's the end of the program, really. 9.29 and 32 seconds. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. This is three weeks now that we've been on air. Can you believe it? Did that not go by quickly? And I've got a special guest that's coming up next week, Thursday for you guys. You don't want to miss this one. This is going to be this person's first appearance on The Cold Hard Truth. So next week, we're going to have you guess at who that person is. And we will give away some gift certificates. So make sure that you tune in on Monday and Tuesday. And you guys have a wonderful and safe weekend. And this is Sandy signing off now for The Cold Hard Truth. I'll see you guys on Monday morning. 
Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Cold Hard Truth on Bobo 89.1 FM. Cayman's number one talk show is live weekdays from 7.30 a.m. Never miss an episode again. Watch anytime on CMR's Facebook and YouTube channels for the latest show episodes. Don't forget to follow us online on our social media channels and visit CaymanMarlRoad.com for all the latest news and community happenings. 